You've heard of hardware, the physical bits that make up our devices, and software, the programs and the code which drive them. I've come here to the shores of Lake Geneva in Switzerland to learn more about wetware, a fascinating and rather strange world of trying to create computing power using living cells rather than silicon. Wetware is a relatively new field of science which involves taking organic matter like brain cells and trying to create a biocomputer out of them. The hope is that one day they'll be powerful enough to process information just like our devices do now and even replace the next generation of data centre servers. I mean, in science fiction, people have been uh, living with these ideas, OK, for uh, quite a long time. But the difference is to make it for real. And when you start to say, I'm going to use a neuron like a little machine, like a transistor, it's a different view on our own brain. The human brain has tens of billions of neurons, or brain cells, which can connect and then talk to each other. It's how we learn. Scientists here want their much smaller and far less powerful lab-grown brain cells to eventually do the same thing. But how? By creating brain organoids, which are a collection of neurons, we connect electrodes to them, so we have bidirectional discussion, if you want, and that's it. The first stage of this lengthy process is performed by Dr. Flora Brozzi, who turns skin cells into stem cells, which eventually become brain organoids. It can take several months before the cells Flora has freshly cultured become the right type of brain organoid. Luckily, though, Final Spark's incubator has about 1,000 ready-to-use ones. And here we have the Shut organoids the that I started three weeks ago. And here you can already see by eye. Yes, you can. So these have sort of clumped together into yes. groups, haven't they? Yes. Flora waits about four months for the organoid to grow into something that looks like this before adopting a microscopic analysis technique called immunofluorescence, which lets her get a better look at what's happening inside the clusters. Here it means that we have plenty of neurons here. So the red is brain cell? Exactly. Yeah. It's neurons. What's in my hands right now are tiny, lab-grown brains. The scientists who make them say they're alive. What's in there will be guided in this lab to become what's in here, to try to make a living computer. It's giving me goosebumps. These lab-grown brain organoids are placed on an electrode where signals can be sent and received. The results are recorded on a traditional PC that's hooked up to the system. So uh, at the beginning, normally, we, un we don't see a lot of activity. It takes a little bit more time, OK? But um, we, we already see a little bit of things, some things, uh, but not a lot. You know, this, uh, on this particular curve here, um, you can see sometimes we have uh, one spike and that's a result. The neurons are interacting. Electrical-based experiments are important steps towards helping the team achieve the bigger goal of teaching the organoid something useful. But it's the same for artificial neural networks, uh, for AI. It's always the same thing. You give some input, you want some output that is useful. For instance, you give a picture of a cat, you want the output to say if it's a cat or a dog. Input, output, OK? This is called the learning process. In 2022, the Australian firm Cortical Labs announced it had managed to teach artificial neurons to play the early computer game Pong. Back in Switzerland, though, the team has just started experimenting with dopamine to varying degrees of success and is using ChatGPT to run experiments for them. We are so happy to, to have uh, him on board, actually. <laughs> it's a him, ChatGPT is a him. From the first experience, what he wants to do, what he does, makes sense to us. Fred recognises that while ChatGPT is energy intensive and that one of their goals is to reduce energy consumption related to AI, the short-term hit is worth it. And one of the objectives of the evolution was to optimise its energy consumption. As a result, a living neuron is one million times more efficient 
as the artificial neuron which are used in ChatGPT, for instance. We expect to have biocomputers consume hundreds times less energy. Actually, not to be a problem anymore. It's very early days. Experts believe we could start to see some advances in biocomputing in the next five to ten years, but there are many hurdles to overcome. The human brain has blood vessels that um, you know, permeate throughout it at multiple scales and sort of provide nutrients to sort of keep it working well. Um, the organoids don't, and we don't yet know how to make them properly. So this is the biggest ongoing challenge. We shouldn't be scared of them. Um, you know, they're just computers made out of a different substrate, of a different material. It happens to be biological tissue, but there's nothing that, that, you know, that they can do that you couldn't also do with a, a silicon computer. Biocomputing is definitely a bit strange, but it has real-world potential as a more environmentally friendly solution to our insatiable need for ever more computing power. Maybe one day our data centres will be more organic and our computers more alive.